So image as uh, location is a suggestive title, probably because it may be read in so many different ways. To begin with, it suggests that more than ever, we are dwellers of an image world, that images have become a new location, our address and abode. And furthermore, it can be interpreted in the wake of an overall movement, which some have described as the spatial turn. The spatial turn, which we could say consists in a contraction of our timeline, uh, expansion of our territory, the optical horizon recedes while temporal depth blurs. It is far more easy for us to navigate on the web than in chronology. Given the almost globalized synchronicity, it becomes all the more important to know where we are. Whereas in the early 20th century, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich stood for the possibility of synchronizing all watches and clocks tuned on the Greenwich Mean Time, this may now largely be taken for granted. The new challenge is to locate parallel movements around the globe. GPS, hypercartography, geotracking devices, all these names stand for the general attempt to track down the permanently shifting positions of subjects and goods in the globalized flows. <laughs> Yet though we may talk about telepresence, ubiquitous computing, virtual omnipresence, physical bodies are still occupying only one and one only spot. Which leads me to the third possible interpretation or understanding of this conference's title, Images as Location. In these past uh, years, we have witnessed um, the emergence of a new form of visual art which deliberately makes, us, makes use of the new potentials of positioning systems. In drawing on the fact that images already are a decisive factor for augmented reality, think of the many applications where the perceptive space registered by the camera is being overlaid with other images from the past, for example, such as this Google Glass application, which allows um, for, um, uh, for a city tour and the overlay with images from World War II. Several artists' collectives have been developing art projects based on these new possibilities. Uh, among those, um, among the first was Disappearing Places, a web platform founded by Matthew Bellinger and uh, Marianne Petit, where users are invited to take pictures of those places that they feel connected to and that have either already disappeared or are going to disappear. So Disappearing Places can be seen as one of the many attempts to give the amnesic web a memory and to show how locations are not something fixed but evolve over time and are subject to the most diverse, effective investments. Another project uh, is Coffee Deposits, set up by Tina Bastagian and Seda Manavolu, I hope I pronounced them correctly, in Istanbul. Uh, based on the observation that the Istanbuli culture is crucially linked to coffee houses as places for debating or handing down stories, and that these old Turkish coffee houses are now threatened to disappear, uh, for the benefit of new cyber cafes where no one talks to each other anymore. These two artists uh, have decided to fight this battle directly on the web. Navigation and GPS will then be seen as our new contemporary versions of divination, divinatory practices, which in the past people used to orient themselves in space and time. A virtual topology of old coffee houses becomes a new site where ancient and recent practices of orientation, storytelling and interpretation interweave. Locative media, which make use of technologies such as GPS or GIS, Geographic Information System, often involve new forms of participatory art. Whereas traditionally participatory art was strongly based on a physical co-presence of the performer and the audience, and sometimes still is, think of Marina Abramovich's um, performance, The Artist is Present, 2010 in the MoMA, and your locative media allows the paradoxical involvement from afar, a kind of mediated immediacy. As it were, this time, visual artists were mainly inspired by net activism. Technologies such as Google Maps have not only allowed the emergence of new customized cut cartographies with their private visually augmented uh, maps, they've also enabled new forms um, of activism such as net ecology. In Land of Fires, a project by the net activist David Boardman, we travel through the sadly notorious Italian region of Caserta near Naples, where hundreds of landfills are concentrated in an area that used to be one of the most fertile in Europe. Waste is everywhere, and when landfills and streets fill the capacity, the trash is set on fire. 
what Google's robot car had recorded impassively, moving between burning flares, net users from all over the globe will perceive differently. This project became part of the general movement against public mismanagement in Italy, but more generally of a transnational campaign against waste dump. Locative media also allows for different understandings of participatory practices. By disseminating in the urban space after the performance, the public may actually contribute to expand and modify the artwork, such as in the project site expansion in the I-Beam Atelier in New York. And for this installation, the two artists, um, Coleman and Goldcran, designed a smart sticker embedded with locational signal, treated with a reflective mirrored surface, and then the participants would uh, uh, spread, disseminate, and post the stickers through the city, creating a, a temporary mesh network of locally expanded sites. Over a 48-hour period, the installation team live-coded the map generated from the distribution of the stickers, and site expansion hence integrates the, the history of a very popular medium, the sticker, uh, with an art references system such as Robert Smithson's Mirrors, for instance, creating a new mapping of spatial and virtual references. So locative uh, media artists have often, often used these new possibilities for creating artworks where the laws of physics are out of their hinges and where bodies can either be elsewhere than they currently are or where bodies factually absent can become present in a sometimes haunting way, such as in the work of the Canadian artist Janet Cardiff. Equipped with either headphones or visualizing device, often both, the users led to walk through a specific, seemingly banal space, which suddenly fills with voices from the past and troublesome presences. Uh, whereas in an early work, such as this one, uh, her long black, hay, long black hair, we are progressively discovering the story of a young mom woman who has lived in these places before. Another installation, uh, which he made uh, for the uh, 2012 uh, documentary in Castle uh, is different because um, we are in the former train station Castle and it progressively uh, becomes clear uh, that we're actually standing uh, in a place which uh, was a main hub for the deportation of uh, Jews in wo during World War II towards the concentration camps in the East. So all these haunting voices come back within the same uh, space. But maybe the most powerful works by Janet Cardiff are not uh, those where uh, images superpose as if, in an, as if in an ancient palimpsest where the older layers of the manuscript is still shining through the new, but artworks where we uh, wouldn't know precisely where those haunting voices originate and from where they speak to us. So rather than thinking of these new forms of um, locative art as tunnels in time connecting the present with a specific historical movement or moment, Janet Cardiff works are all the more compelling when they dispossess us of the usual attempts to track down events and locate them on a spatial temporal map. So to think image as location, and this is going to be what I'd like to propose as a critical starting point for our discussion, is not a neutral move. It is certainly a necessary move if we finally want to take into account what is definitely among the most wide-ranging developments in media technology of these last years, and which also has a major impact on visual creation, goes without saying. But it is not an innocent move either. Relocating the question of images, of their efficacy, their power, their functioning, into logic of place has consequences for the way in which we think about images. We could even argue that the attempt of relocating images, pinning down a position, tying them to a geographical point, is but one of the many ways in which humans responded to the profoundly unsettling, displacing power of images. In ancient, uh, uh, well, I've already shown it, so I'll leave it on. In ancient Greece, people wondered about those strange archaic figures that were found in the Cycladic Islands and elsewhere. They were so strange, so foreign with respect to the naturalistic statues they themselves used to build, that they decided they could not be of human origin, but they, they were fashioned by the gods who had inadvertently let them fall. These figures were thus called the petes uh, in, in Greek, so images from the sky. Some centuries later, Cicero links up with this tradition when describing with awe a statue which, as he says, was not baked by man, but had fallen from the sky. And in the desert of Marfa, um, Donald Judd had set up, starting in the 60s, set up uh, these uh, cubes, uh, these strange um, forms 
as if they had fallen from the skies too, in a very archaic way, some kind of aeroliths of an uncertain origin, as it were. The artist didn't build those cubes. He had them industrially manufactured. And um, strictly speaking, these, these uh, objects belong to the category of the archaeopoetic images. So literally, images of divine origin which were not made of human hand. Care is the hand, in, as is in um, surgery. Uh, archaeopoetic images, images with that were not made of, of uh, human hand, as they were known in the Christian Middle Ages. One of the most famous examples, you see it here, is the Holy Shroud, which is uh, kept at Turin. Um, so these images of a uh, sort of direct imprint of uh, the referent into the image. The most advanced radiocarbon dating techniques have been applied to this object. But do we really understand the phenomenon any better now that we know the linen is not from the first century, but from somewhere between 1260 and 1390? Is it uh, to know where an image was produced or where it is located? Is it any telling for, for us to know about how that image works? Why are images affecting us and can affectivity be deduced from topography? The second point. In his, face, in his first major book, Essay sur les données immédiates de la conscience from 1888, Henri Bergson criticized the spatializing of affects. Affects such as joy or pain have very little to do with locations. As Bergson points out, in order to understand where the certain pain is, it takes little to know how and where it comes to be. A toothache, that's his famous example, a toothache is not determined by its location or by its extension, it is determined by its intensity. I would be hard pressed to localize the exact site of my toothache as it pervades my entire mouth, my entire head, my entire being. A toothache is not a matter of extension. A toothache is a matter of intensity. What are we to do with this suggestion by Henri Bergson? In 20th century, a line of critical thinkers has taken up Bergson's intuition, considering that images should not be theorized as localized entities, but as intensive phenomena. Images, to put this in a nutshell, are not extensive, they are intensive. Bergson was influential in a tradition associated today with Gilles Deleuze, especially in film studies, also the American version of it, but he was also influential, and this might be less known, in a certain phenomenological tradition, such as that of Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Upon analyzing the prehistoric, prehistoric cave paintings of Lascaux, Merleau-Ponty asks himself what makes the difference between a thing and an image, and comes to the conclusion that images don't belong to the realm of physically located things, but are always already out of place. But if this is the case, then one would be hard pressed to say where the intensity is located in the image. Or in Merleau-Ponty's words, the animals painted on the walls of Lascaux are not there in the same way as the fissures and limestone formations. But where are these animals? Is their representation to be taken literally? Are the painted animals simply representations that gesture towards a real presence which would be located elsewhere? Are images merely indexical traces of things that might be tracked down as being somewhere else in space or in time? Melopoti denies that. The animals painted on the walls are not simply elsewhere, he says, and what is true of the painted animal is true of the painting itself. Quote again, I would be hard pressed to say where the picture is that I'm gazing at. Drawing on Richard Walheim and his notion of seeing in, one could say that we see the prehistoric animal in the surface of the cave wall, seeing into the, the cave uh, wall, um, despite the cracks and splits which make its reading difficult. But Meloponti, I think, goes a step further. We could also say, along with Meloponti, that we see according to the image, selon l'image, with or along the lines of those cracks and crevices, and yet to see more than what meets the eye. So this is taking the materiality into account. With respect to what there is, the image is always already both lacking behind and excessive in its sensorial overpresence. The beholder would be hard pressed to locate it on the wall and to frame it, but it is exceeding in its topographic ascription in another sense too. If images are attributed an emotive power, that is to say that there are literally moving emotio, 
emotion and capable of producing a response. From where does the power come from which gives images that start in capacity of displacing us? On a fresco by Andrea Mantegna, uh, the perilous exposure of those who are willing to risk a gaze is marvelously exemplified. We see a figure of a moment of a man who just a moment ago was still leaning out on his balcony and was then shot right into uh, his left eye by a long white arrow. Um, where did that arrow come from? Where did the archer stand? And who shot him? His fellow comrade is completely dazed and tries to help the blinded man who dares to, f to fall as a result uh, of uh, the shot. The intensity comes first. The question of the origin will only set in belatedly at best. Where is the image which strikes us? And where are we exactly on the moment it strikes us? Among the theorists, We've tried addressing this question, there is a very prominent one, Roland Barthes, in his famous photography book, Camera Lucida, La Chambre Claire. And in that book, Barthes asks about the power of photographs, about a power which goes beyond the mere documentation of events in the world and the knowledge thereof. There is something in a photographic knowledge I cannot approach via epistemic di dissection, and here, he is, of course, criticizing the semiotic approach he had been endorsing himself. This epistemic order, Barth calls it with a notion from uh, medieval scholasticism, the notion of studium. And he says, there is something which exceeds the studious investigation via dissection. There is something else which is specific to images, and this, this other thing he calls a punctum. What is the point of an image? What is the striking feature an image points towards the beholder? How come something as flat as an image can hit us without warning? The punctum is thus the sharp, effective side of the image which cannot be reduced to its content or message. Yet, and this is maybe the most telling part of the, the whole story, Barth does exactly what he's criticizing. He tries to pinpoint where the punctum is. And on this famous photograph by Lewis Hine, um, photograph of 1924 in an institution in New Jersey, he says, I'm not interested uh, in these uh, supposedly monstrous heads. Um, I'm interested in something else. The only thing that actually keeps my attention awake is this strange Danton color of the boy. And it is the fact that the girl uh, has uh, this, this um, um, bandage around the finger. So he's actually trying to localize where the punctum is on an image. This is where the punctum is. This is where it all comes from. The punctum, says Barth, is what keeps me looking even before I've spotted what keeps me looking. But what are we to do with this? What is the relation between seeing and knowing, between punctum and stadium, uh, sorry, punctum and studium, between, between affection and analysis, and what does all of this have to do with the issue of location? Is it enough to say, this is where it all happens? I'll come to my third and last point, the atopic nature of images. The medieval uh, metaphysician, logician, and optical scientist John Peckham from the 13th century has an amazing definition of what an image consists of. And here it goes. What is an image? Um, what is an image, he says? Why doesn't it work? Okay, uh, what is an image? The mere appearance uh, of a thing out of its place. Sola apparentia rei extra locum sum. What is an image? The mere appearance of a thing out of its place. Extra locum sum. So what does he mean by this? A little later he explains that things may appear in two different positions. Either where they are, in this case where they are perceived, or otherwise where they are not. In the latter case, however, this appearance doesn't coincide with the thing itself. There is a gap or an opening. The thing appears where there's no thing. And this latter appearance receives a proper name, in Latin, idolum, image. Images are things that appear out of place. But of course, this fact is much more problematic than it seems at first. As images not only appear out of place in order to supplement for the absent thing, as a reminder, for instance, but sometimes they also lay an undue claim on the position where the thing should be. 
images then substitute to the things they are supposed to serve. They take over and claim the place of the thing itself. This is where the infinite pretension, the hubris of the image comes from. And images are not only out of place because they appear where there is nothing. This was the uh, uh, position of Jean-Paul Sartre's famous theory of the imaginary, where he says, we are, you either perceive or you imagine. And we only imagine where there is no thing. So either or. The problem is we, images not only appear where there is no thing or where there is nothing, but they're also out of place because they displace the order of things. Images, to put this yet differently, are a threat to the traditional epistemic division between things and signs. Plato spoke in a very uh, similar fashion. In his dialogue, The Sophist, the image, he says, is always already out of place, atopon, um, and, um, because there is no position for the image within the order of knowledge. And this is, uh, just as in so many other languages, being out of place, atopon in Greek, has not only a topographic dimension, but also refers to its destabilizing, destabilizing threat. It is noteworthy to recall that Socrates himself was said to be an atopon for the Athenians, not so much because he would be a foreigner uh, and came from without, but because he disrupted certainties from within. And this is why all the attempts to close the image in the framework of a new science, and I'm, of course, in particular thinking of the attempts of the German-speaking world to lay the grounds of a new image science, Bildwissenschaft, uh, which I was also involved in, are deemed to fail, I believe. To think that there is something like an isolated domain of images is to fall back into extensional ontologies, whereas what we need is a circumstantial phenomenology of those atopic appearances we call images. What images do is not a question of essence, but of thresholds, not a question of pedigree, but a question of uh, degree. Uh, the old question, what is an image and where to locate it, should therefore at best be replaced with the question, when is an image? Thank you for your attention. That is amazing. That is the first philosophical talk that I've heard that was compelling and on time. How could, you, how could you do this? That was amazing. Thank you. Um, let's, let's honor the, the amazing uh, talk with some questions. And I have a question to start you, uh, start you off with. Please come over here. Yeah. Um, and the question is, you, you had this term of uh, images that are not made by people, achairontic images. Yeah, achairopoetic. Uh, poetic images. So are satellite images made by machines? Are they achairopoetic or not? That's, uh, I think I was very uh, uh, startled by what uh, Regula said yesterday night. Oh, oh, it was a Jenny, I, I'm now mixing up, but uh, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh, uh, images, most of our images today are not made uh, by humans anymore. And most of the images are not made for humans either. They're made by machines for machines. Of course, if we say such a thing, we may ask ourselves, are these really images? I mean, is an algorithm an image? Uh, is there a difference uh, between a data uh, a set and an image? Uh, you, may, you may know that the new version of the Turing test is now based on images, captures. You use them all the time. That's very interesting. It seems humans have a capacity for analyzing images that goes far beyond what machines can do. And that refers to a, a wide knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge of a visual knowledge, uh, which you cannot be brought down to a code. But that's yet another topic on, on the intelligence of image as a test for telling humans and machines apart. To answer your questions, satellite images are, uh, and all these, these automatically produced images, I think, have to be referred back to these very archaic images with these acheropoetic images, we, we entered uh, the time of uh, the um, mechanical reproduction of artworks because these magical images of Christ were actually self-reproducing. There is a wonderful account by Byzantine uh, monks uh, where they had an icon of, of Christ uh, which was uh, uh, put into... Uh, into um, uh, behind bricks because they, uh, uh, some heathens were afraid of it. And it actually reproduced itself and it left an imprint in the brick. It's a famous keramidion. So actually, we, we are very close to what Walter Benjamin told the technical 
uh, reproductivity, reproductivity, whatever, it's a long word, of, of, of images and of, of artworks. And of course, I'm, I'm very much favoring an approach which would uh, think these anachronistic uh, coincidences over time. Good, thank you. One more quick question, Mark. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, related to what you just said. Um, thank you. Um, I took your argument to be that the, the impulse to relocate or place recovery projects <coughs> are more or less a universal response to the atopic nature of images. And I'm, I'm interested to hear to what degree you want to let a historical argument come in and where the special conditions of portability and reproducibility today are, are motivating a different degree or a different hmm. kind of response rather than this kind of universal response. Yeah. Um, I mean, this, this would be the next task, of course, to, to do the specific genealogies, analyses, uh, uh, in specific uh, cultural contexts, in specific technological contexts, specific historic contexts. I've been trying to do this for uh, uh, the field which I know a little better, which is uh, uh, Western philosophy, so where I think I, I, I showed uh, how this, uh, the attempts to, to pin down, to pinpoint exactly wh where the image should be in order for it not to, to derange us anymore uh, happened. Uh, but I'm sure this uh, can be done and it should be done in many different fields. It should be done uh, uh, w with respect to new technologies today. And we have uh, uh, the expertise uh, uh, of people who is gathered here today uh, who could do this in a much better fashion than I could. But we should also do this in a transcultural way, of course. Uh, so uh, this claim is quite general and it needs to be specified. Uh, but of course, I, I, I don't have the arms, the weapons, the instruments for doing it, but I, I would be very happy if some people want to join in this project. Let's crowdsource it. Thank you so much. Thank Emmanuel. You.